Stephen Ennis will be giving our next talk. Uh, Stephen is the director of the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas at Austin. He did his undergraduate studies at Davidson College, followed by a library degree from Emory University and a PhD in English from the University of Georgia. He has held previous appointments at the Folger Shakespeare Library and at Emory University's Manuscript, Archives, and Rare Book Library. His research interests are in 20th century poetry and is the biographer of the poet Derek Mann. He is recipient of a Leverholm Fellowship from the University of London. Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be with you this morning and to take part in these discussions about the past, present, and future of special collections. As you heard a moment ago, um, I previously held an appointment at the Folger Shakespeare Library and only recently in the past year have moved to the directorship of the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas in Austin. I um, sometimes describe that, that transit, that move as a, a feat of time travel traveling essentially from the 16th and early 17th centuries up to the 20th and 21st century. That said, despite those abilities for time travel, I have not been to the future. So uh, when asked to address this conference on that topic, it did indeed give me pause. I'll begin, however, the only way I can, and that is begin, beginning with earlier collections and propelling myself through the 18th, 19th, and 20th century, and we'll see how far into the future I make it. In 1794, Samuel Ireland announced the discovery of a trove of Shakespeare letters and manuscripts, including what he claimed was the original manuscript of King Lear. That's the image you see on the title, a title slide in front of you, which I should add is from Sarah Thomas's collection at Harvard. The public, the public interest in the discovery was so great that tickets had to be distributed to manage the number of people that wished to crowd into Ireland's home to see the papers. Hearing about the discovery, the diarist James Boswell joined the throng, and upon seeing the manuscript for the first time, he's said to have kissed it, and then remarked, I shall now die contented since I've lived to witness the present moment. Boswell apparently meant it and was dead within a few weeks. <laughs> The Ireland forgeries, as they are now known, were only exposed as fakes when the forger, Samuel Ireland's own son, William, tried to pass off an entire play of his own as a newly discovered work by Shakespeare. Plans were made to produce the newly discovered play, Vortigern and Rowena, at London's Drury Lane Theater. But on opening night, the audience saw through the obvious fraud and disrupted the performance with derisive laughter. The disturbance was so great, the, the actors were unable to go on. I'm interested in the Ireland forgeries, not because of the fraud that was perpetuated, but for what the story tells us about the status of the literary manuscript at the end of the 18th century. If nothing else, the literary manuscript was a revered enough object to be worth forging. I'd like to speak to you this morning about the literary manuscript, about the letter, and other objects of study that make up our institution's rich archival collections. I'm particularly interested in examining how our attitudes towards these artifacts have shifted over time. And most relevant to us today, the opportunities posed by the fundamental change in the nature of the contemporary archive. Over the 18th and 19th centuries, when the vogue of autograph collecting was at its height, it was not uncommon for signatures to be clipped from letters and other documents to assemble in an autograph album, and I'm sure many of us have examples in our own collections. Here, a letter from John Ruskin has been mutilated for just this purpose. The signature has been clipped from the bottom of the page and the body of the letter left behind as of little interest. It was the signature, the personal mark of the author, that was the coveted object. The autograph was not so much an object of study as it was an object of veneration and devotion. On some level, the signature, its very expressiveness, 
was a stand-in for the absent author in a way his words were not. While autograph collecting continues today, the signature works in another way, often serving to differentiate the machine-made object and fix that artifact, a bookseller, excuse me, a best-selling author's trade book, for example, to fix that artifact in a particular place in time. Manuscripts, manuscript editions emerged in the end of the 19th century and were part aimed at addressing this function, differentiating the machine-made text. Samuel Clemens, Walt Whitman, and Henry David Thoreau all had collections of manuscripts cannibalized and scattered widely for just this purpose. In this example, an individual leaf of a Walt Whitman manuscript has been bound into this manuscript edition of Whitman's works to create, in a sense, an extra illustrated volume that is a unique work. I'd note that it also, this particular sample also shows us the cutting and pasting that Ken Lopez was speaking of yesterday. Here we have a passage from Specimen Days, Whitman's autobiographical reflections on his own early life and his experience of what he calls here in this passage, the Succession War. In order to dispel any doubts about the authenticity of the text, a notary public has conveniently affixed a seal certifying that the accompanying sheet is a page of original manuscript. This practice uh, persists in a number of contemporary fine press printers. Uh, printers. Uh, for many years, Leonard Baskin's Gehenna Press issued such works, including poet Ted Hughes's final collection of poems, Howls and Whispers which was published in a special edition of only 10 copies, each of which had similarly contained a leaf of Hughes's holograph manuscript. The literary manuscript, as these few examples demonstrate, has held a persistent value as a coveted object for many years. However, what we are experiencing now and what I want to discuss today is the altered form the literary manuscript takes today, and by extension, the very nature of the archive itself. While the dates may vary from one individual to another, all of us who work with collections of personal papers or archives can date the change quite precisely. For J.M. Coetzee, it occurred between the life and times of Michael Kay and his next novel, Foe. As these manuscripts reveal, somewhere between 1982, here we have a corrected typescript of the life and times of Michael Kay. Between 1982 and 1985, here we have a manuscript, if you will, of his novel, Foe. Um, the manuscript significantly changed, and I dare say, um, this, this one that's on your screen now may be a manuscript that is hard to love. For Salman Rushdie, it occurred relatively late after the publication of the Satanic Verses in 1988, but before the publication of The Moor's Last Sigh in 1995. For Gabriel Garcia Marquez, it came early, after A Chronicle of a Death Foretold in 1981, which you see here, a corrected typescript, and before Love in the Time of Cholera, which you see here. In between these two books, Garcia Marquez received the Nobel Prize in Literature. Holograph manuscript drafts, of course, long ago gave way to typescripts corrected in the author's hand, which have subsequently given way to, clean, to the clean pointillism of the dot matrix printer with its own curiously vintage appearance. And here you see the manuscript of Love in the Time of Cholera again with that very recognizable font designed by Apple in the 1980s for its on-screen legibility. It's safe to say now that virtually all textual production, what used to be called writing, is done on a computer. Garcia Marquez once described his own process of writing this way. Every afternoon, I pull my work out of the printer, I take the pages to bed, I read them, and I make corrections and notes in the margins. 
He added, if they had given me a computer 20 years ago, I would have written twice as many books as I have. And here you see him 20 years earlier working not at his computer, but at his typewriter. And here, and I'll put with apologies to Terry Bellinger for the poor image quality, here you see Gabriel Garcia Marquez working in the early 1980s at his first Apple computer. Corrected computer-generated typescripts resemble the corrected typescript of the 1960s and 70s. The extent of the holograph emendation, like the autograph that differentiates the machine-made object, persists as a source of interest and, in the trade, a source of monetary value. It persists as a singular record of the author's creative process. While Garcia Marquez may have marked up his pages in bed, Others complete their revisions at the computer itself, and it's not uncommon to find an author's literary manuscripts, as Ken Lopez reminded us yesterday, it's not uncommon to find these manuscripts exist as a set of clean, unblemished pages of 20-pound bond copy paper. Also, entering our archives, often in great quantity, are all manner of digital storage media, with little discernible evidence of the author's hand. The Norman Mailer archive at the Ransom Center contains 359 computer disks, 40 CDs, six mini data cartridges, and three laptop computers. Mailer would no doubt be delighted with his own prolixity, though it appears the bulk of this electronic content was created by his assistant, Judith McNally. The absence of an authorial hand or a notary's seal of approval, raises important questions about the authenticity of the digital objects accumulating in our collections. When, when floppies and three and a half inch diskettes began showing up in the contemporary writer's archives I was assembling at my university in the 1990s, our processing staff didn't know quite what to do with them. If we were lucky, the disk had been labeled in some fashion, and one could record the detail in a finding A before dropping it into a box. It wasn't practical to open the files to compare them with typescripts elsewhere in the archive, nor would that have been a good idea, as our digital archives now remind us. In this regard, these born digital files resemble, in many ways, the audio tape and other magnetic media in our archives that also resist easy archival appraisal. Little wonder that some advised rendering the unfamiliar familiar by printing out the files and cataloging not the diskettes, but these newly minted manuscripts. A solution that reminds me something of the British Library's practice for many years of binding loose manuscripts so they resemble something more like a book. Further contributing to the blurring of distinction, often our finding aids do not differentiate between a typescript produced on a typewriter and a computer-generated printout, but the former is a unique record of a creative work at one moment in its composition and the latter may exist in many multiples. When the object is not a computer printout at all, but still in digital form, its ability to be re reproduced is unlimited. The fragility of the storage medium itself, in fact, requires replication and a protocol for refreshing that digital data. But it's important to draw a distinction here based on the conversations we've been hearing over the last two days. What we're talking about here is not digitization, but reformatting of content with, that was always uh, digital. Practice is still widely inconsistent, however, and a recent survey of UK archival institutions noted that nearly half of the, re of the respondents simply do not accept digital storage media. Time will tell whether this proves to be a successful strategy. And having written that comment, which I realize may sound unkind, um, I'm re I had to reconsider after Sarah Thomas's uh, talk yesterday when she spoke about a policy of responsible ownership. In other words, don't accept what you cannot properly care for. And so, in light of Sarah's remarks yesterday, I would choose to revise and perhaps take a more charitable view of that decision not to accept such media. 
Nevertheless, what seems clear is that much is being lost, whether through a refusal to accept it or uncertainty with just what to do with it when it does come into our, in with our archives. Harvard recently discovered among the John Updike papers five and a quarter inch program disk for Lotus AmiPro word processing software, popular in the early 1990s, indicating there must at one time have been five and a quarter, a quarter inch floppies, though none are present in the archive. I don't have a photograph of Updike at his computer, but here he is looking about 13 years old, smoking a cigarette. Um, at his typewriter. What did survive among the Updike papers, however, are 40 uh, three, three and a half inch diskettes dating from a later period of his writing life. It appears he used these to mail stories and reviews to his editors at the New Yorker and elsewhere. While Updike was meticulous about saving drafts that he'd printed out and revised, he did not take the same attitude toward the digital files themselves and discarded used disk and overwrote other files as he revised. Whether we welcome these developments or not, the form the literary manuscript takes in our archives has forever changed. It's safe to say Boswell would feel no temptation to kiss a contemporary manuscript, <laughs> though he would be able to read the words. <laughs> and that brings us actually to the crux of the matter. As long as these drafts reflect the creative decisions of the working writer, they will hold their research value as a record of the process of composition, as evidence of the, of the writer's once solitary struggle with his muse. I dare say future textual projects will adapt to these new manuscript forms. And in time, we may even grow nostalgic for the pointillism of that dot matrix printer or Apple's earliest fonts. When I arrived at Salman Rushdie's London home to see his literary archive, I discovered he had stored his old and obsolete computers in a closet. Yes, I, would told, I was told these computers would be included with his papers. Rushdie was represented in this sale by the literary agent, Andrew Wiley, who was eager to emphasize the research potential of these machines. I've received volumes of email correspondence that are frankly far more interesting than the traditional selection of written letters, Wiley noted. In asking us to shift our attention from the literary manuscript to Rushdie's email, Wiley was actually on to something important, I think. He was commenting on the character of email, its unguarded spontaneity, its conversational quality, very different from the conventions of a formal letter. It is, he insisted, a very, very valuable resource. Wiley more typically negotiates publishing contracts for his clients. And in this instance, too, he was intent on driving the sale price for the Rushdie papers as high as he possibly could. In the end, however, no precedent was set for the value of the born digital content in Rushdie's archive, since the purchase price did not differentiate what portion of the total was for the traditional paper-based archive and what portion, if any, for the born digital archive. No one involved in this negotiation separated the value of the digital from the value of the paper, and therefore no precedent was set for the digital having any monetary value whatsoever. Why does this matter? It may, in fact, matter a great deal. Whatever else we may have to say about the trade in writers' archives, it is that trade that has ensured the survival of countless collections of letters and manuscripts. It is that awareness of an archive's monetary value that has led to a high survival rate for scores of paper-based archives. And it follows that uncertainty about the value of born digital content poses a real threat to the survival of our 21st century archives. It has now been more than two decades since the widespread adoption of email in our homes and workplaces. Its penetration into all aspects of our daily lives 
suggest a digital archive of our electronic lives could easily run into tens or even hundreds of thousands of messages researchers at Stanford have recently estimated. Since 1997, Ian McEwen has systematically archived his email correspondence. And unlike a paper-based archive where one may only find the incoming letters, the McEwen archive, which the Ransom Center recently acquired, contains both sides of that exchange. I didn't set out to save my emails, McEwen has explained. I just didn't know how to get rid of them. <laughs> it's a mountain of see you at 8 o'clock. <laughs> Every now and then, there must be a signif significant ones, but the sheer volume is very great, he said. Yet it seems clear that the full range of an author's life experience something close to the full range of an author's life experience is documented in these email communications. Those experiences are recounted in real time, often without self-consciousness, except the consciousness of the sender and the recipient. I email a lot, so there's all sorts of stuff there, Rushdie said, but don't ask me to remember what it is. Our modern literary archives have been assembled, of course, to support particular types of critical inquiry. Traditionally, the, the privileged object within the archive has been the literary manuscript reflected in the primacy given to literary works and often in the order of our finding aids. These archives supported major textual projects of the 1950s and 60s at a time when authorial intention seemed a realistic goal and one could still claim to publish a definitive edition without embarrassment. Textual projects now seek less the stability of the text than its instability, leading to important digital additions that reconstruct not a pure authorial intention, but the competing status of text at any given moment. Thus, the Mark Twain Papers Project based at Berkeley, for example, becomes a site of competing textual claims. While the literary works entering our archives today may be the object of close textual analysis, we have decades to wait before they will become the object of scholarly editions. Critical editions of Ian McEwen, Norman Mailer, Salman Rushdie, and John Updike are many years off if indeed that scholarly interest emerges at all. What this means is we are capturing and preserving a highly ephemeral, born digital resource in hopes that these files will satisfy the curiosity of a distant and future reader. In many cases, we may have years to wait before we will see these aspects of our contemporary archives have a useful life. No wonder one could be tempted to turn a blind eye to the born digital record entirely. Somewhere along the way, perhaps with the death of the author, the author became a corporate entity, and archives became voluminous gatherings of all aspects of the process of textual production. Cultural studies helped to expand the notion of textual objects and encourage the use of our archives to examine the historical interconnections of writers and communities of writers, the business of literary production, the process of canonization, reading practices among different communities of readers in different times and places. These later lines of inquiry will no doubt be further illuminated by the large quantity of email accumulating in contemporary archives. For the near term, it seems likely some of the heaviest research interest may well reside in the email communications of authors within their circle of friendships and associates, while interest in the lives of the poets, to use Samuel Johnson's memorable phrase, seems likely to persist. Of interest to us today, however, is not merely the endurance of the archive over time, something that I don't believe is in doubt, but the potential to ask new questions of the archive, the emergence of new forms of, of inquiry itself. As Alice Schreier noted yesterday, scholarship is becoming deeply collaborative with important implications for our work. The large-scale digitization of books as essentially textual objects had the unanticipated consequence of drawing attention to the physical features of these works. Indeed, the growth in the history of the book as a discipline has only been accelerated by the imaging work of the 1990s and 2000s. 
From the beginning, the large-scale digitization of research collections has offered the promise of overcoming time and space and reuniting widely scattered manuscripts and archives. We now have a means to reunite those very Walt Whitman manuscripts and countless other archives which were so widely scattered at the turn of the previous century. These digitization projects, some of which we heard referenced yesterday, privilege often the singular author working alone. And one of the byproducts of the large-scale digitization of books has been the opportunity for textual analysis centered not on a canonical author or on a single work, but on a corpus far larger than any one individual could ever read, what Alice called non-consumptive reading. Thus, at the Folger Shakespeare Library, researchers are conducting linguistic analysis on a large collection of digitized text to learn more about word usage, about metaphor, genre in the 16th and 17th centuries, to pose just one question they hope to answer, did Shakespeare really invent the many words he's said to have coined, or or is his high scoring simply the result of his text serving as preferred source text for lexographers of, er of an earlier day? The highly selective view of the past we heard Elizabeth speak of yesterday. To put it another way, what would the linguistic analysis of a large body of 17th century text tell us about Shakespeare's inventiveness, about distinctive features of comedy, history, and tragedy? and about other genres, including nonfiction prose. How would those answers differ if the source text were not a small number of literary text, but a database of many thousands of text? Re researchers, for the first time, have the tools to answer such questions. The growing body of born digital content in the contemporary archive may offer us the ability to perform similar analysis on a large body, um, excuse me, on the large bodies of electronic text accumulating in our special collections. As the quantity of this born digital content grows, it seems likely that the, that the next decade will see the further development of new tools for the analysis and manipulation of large bodies of electronic communications. The scale alone will require it. Researchers at Stanford are already experimenting with tools that infer social groups within email messages based on a grouping logarithm. Further, what's called sentiment analysis based on textual cues can be mapped using, using visualization techniques. And while we may recoil from machine-based analysis, which seems, after all, a poor substitute for reading, the further development of these kinds of tools will only become more necessary as the quantity of born digital content grows too large to be easily read. Greater facility with digital content within our archives will, I predict, bring renewed attention to long neglected elements of the archive, those elements requiring digital reformatting, such as audio and moving image recordings. It seems likely that this interest will only accelerate with the increasing acceptance of entirely new forms of digital publication. The monograph is no longer the only product our researchers envision when they arrive at our reading rooms. They may be creating a website, a database, or some form of visu visu visualization that makes creative use of image and sound. The web offers us a space for innovative forms of publication, and I'd like to call out just one that my English department colleague at the University of Texas, Janine Barkas, has undertaken, a website she's developed called What Jane Saw. This web-based publication provides a visual simulation of the art gallery in Pall Mall which we know from Jane Austen's diaries she visited on May 24th, 1813. Visitors to the site can move into the space and then turn to the various walls here displayed and view, if you will, high quality digital images of the Joshua Reynolds paintings that Austen also viewed on that afternoon. 
This online gallery space serves as a superstructure on which a rich layer of historical and contextual information is provided about Austin, about Joshua Reynolds, and about the 19th century museum going experience. While copyright will continue to hinder the full exploitation of literary text for years to come, the open access movement and the development of non-restrictive licensing policies is encouraging and even accelerating non-traditional uses of our archives. All evidence suggests that the transformation that is underway in our archives will enable entirely new sets of questions not necessarily based on reading. Questions like, how distinctive was Shakespeare's speech? Or, what did Jane Austen see? What these developments highlight for us, I trust, are fundamental changes in the object of study itself. While some researchers will continue to visit the Born Digital Archive to read a work, and to compare one manifestation of a text with earlier and later versions, others will no doubt be looking for entirely new forms of evidence of the creative process. Within the community examining these questions, some, some have embraced the techniques of law enforcement and seek to apply tools for digital forensics to our archives to recover keystrokes, deleted files, the equivalent of reading through a struck through passage of a manuscript of an earlier day. Others are committed to emulating the desktop environment of the author's computer, what Salman Rushdie saw each morning when he powered up his personal computer, which versions of software he used, his file structure, his naming conventions. For others, the growing body of electronic content is a source of data ripe for machine analysis of the kind researchers at Stanford are exploring. To Richard Lindemann's question yesterday about whether this work belongs in our special collections, I would suggest simply it's just, it is up, up to us. As Bob Jackson noted in his opening remarks for this gathering, we will control the future of special collections librarianship. And a look around this room <clears throat> should leave no doubt that the next 10, 20, even 30 years of our profession's work is in the hands of some of those gathered here. That does not mean, however, that each of us must embrace this particular challenge. If I could offer just one critique of the two-day conversation we have been having, it would be that we re represent, it seems to me, a remarkably diverse group of special collections institutions, different in size, in funding, in governance, in mission, sometimes quite different in the communities that we serve. What we are discussing over these two days is not, I hope, a conformist future. Indeed, I would argue that one of the great riches of the special collections community is its diversity, so abundantly represented in this room. Each of us will need to make decisions about the changing nature of the contemporary archive, our capacity for that new work, and its value to the communities that we serve. Ironically, the great promise of digital technology, built as it is on a network of interconnected computers, is constrained by the privacy and co copyright concerns of living figures. Salman Rushdie may have been able to use the internet to stay connected to a global literary community linking London, New York, and Mumbai, but his born digital archive enjoys none of those benefits. One still must travel to Atlanta to read the email communications that he once transmitted from London to New York at a keystroke. Files that once moved near the speed of sound are now bound to a reading room desk, underscoring the degree to which the legal and policy framework lags far beyond technological change. So while the archive will remain, I believe, a rich site for research, for both traditional and increasingly innovative forms of inquiry, these new lines of inquiry will lead to increasingly urgent questions about the privacy rights of individuals in a culture already deeply conflicted over the boundaries of public and private. 
We are increasingly capturing born digital content as a regular processing activity, and the pro protocols for stabilizing that content and ensuring its integrity over time are emerging. What is most needed now are not tools, I don't believe, but policies that will guide the access and use of this growing resource. It follows that surprising new questions will be asked of this changing archive. We will continue to see new lines of questioning emerging from our special collections and with, e and with it equally innovative forms of visualizing and sharing that scholarship. Even amid these changes, however, I'd like to remind us all that the archive is more than a site of questioning and interrogation. In fact, much of the power of the artifacts we hold in our special collections derives not from their informational content, but from their persistent presence over time. When the novelist Zadie Smith was asked what she thought would become of her digital archive, she replied, I guess it will all go the way of everything else I write on the computer, oblivion. In closing, let me say, Resistance to Oblivion is one of our special collection's most meaningful roles. Manuscripts, letters, locks of hair, all are evidence of a provisional victory over time itself. On some level, the question for us is whether oblivion can be filled by something as insubstantial as an electrical current moving over a silicon chip. Friends, I don't know the answer to that question, but I would insist to you this morning that the ephemeral nature of our special collections has always been a surprising source of their power. Thank you very much. Be happy to respond to questions or comments. Uh, great talk, Stephen. Uh, I'm Julie Grobe from the University of Houston Libraries. And I'm wondering um, what advice you might give, having worked with uh, Writers Digital Collections, for people who want to work with uh, current writers on how best to manage their material, and how much do you think that's going to become a work of, of curators who work with literary collections? Yeah. Um, I actually think that the, the ephemeral nature of born digital material itself is, is going to drive uh, earlier intervention and uh, earlier cultivation of relationship with, with authors um, who, who do produce these, these still um, desirable um, manuscript records in some, some form. And uh, the very ephemeral nature of that material uh, for it to survive is, is going to require guidance. Um, you know, I think part of um, Richard's question yesterday was, you know, why uh, us? Why, why do this in special collections? And perhaps not everyone needs to. The rare book library may not feel compelled to, but the institution that, that hopes to document the, the literary creativity of the contemporary moment will, will have to confront these questions. And I would urge those of you engaged in that kind of work to, to seek early intervention with the authors to, to guide um, the, the capture of that digital material while it still exists. That said, um, we, we know quite clearly that archives have never been uh, complete. And I, I would insist that the notion of a complete archive is a, a total fantasy. Material has, has always been lost and, and will continue, uh, the archival record will continue to have, have gaps, significant gaps. But I'm, I'm actually encouraged that um, the, the kinds of, of richness that we might see in a born digital archive um, can be a very full record. Um, 
certainly the, the traditional correspondence that in the past would have been one-sided uh, of the incoming letters. I can't tell you the number of times a researcher has arrived at my institution to read the letters of some notable figure only to find that what they're looking at when they call up the box is the letters that person received. Um, what we're now seeing, of course, is both sides of that correspondence uh, documented quite fully if the intervention occurs and, and if this material is, uh, is brought on board uh, at an early date. Thank you for your question. Uh, we're in an interesting situation right now, um, negotiating with an organization whose papers we want to take in. And all of those papers are born digital. They've, they've never existed in a non-digital realm. And one of the um, very legitimate stipulations that the donor wants is that we build a website around these so that their constituencies can use the collections easily and from wherever they, they are, which sounds like great sense to us, too. We're, we're all on board with that. The thing that happened, though, was that, that in special collections, we envisioned this as the acquisition of a manuscript collection, just like any other thing we've done for hundreds of years. But we don't have, within special collections, the technical ability to build out the kind of thing that they, that they want to, to display it. So we took it to our digital production team, right? And they saw it not as the acquisition of a manuscript collection, but as a digital project, right? And had a very different vision of what its priorities would be, of how it should fit in with our website, should it at all, and how it should work. And what we're doing right now, we're finding, is, is not so much negotiating with the dealer, I mean, not the dealer, with the organization who wants to give us their papers, but we're, organ we're, we're negotiating within our library for how the hell are we going to handle this material. And in the past, we've always been sort of our own players. We could take in a box of papers, we could process them, we could create a finding aid, and all is well. But now we're finding that the, the negotiations are, are much more complicated within our own institution for dealing with this. I was wondering if you could comment on any yeah. of your experiences with yeah. that. Um, so, so yes, it, it strikes me that the situation you describe is, is um, part of what Alice was referring to yesterday in the, in the growth in uh, scholarly collaborations in our institutions. And increasingly, those, those of us who hold such types of material, electronic uh, resources, born digital material, uh, what might in an earlier time have been an archival collection, um, increasingly, we're, we're finding ourselves needing to partner with uh, digital humanists and uh, technology staff who can be very creative in, in offering up that resource uh, to new audiences. Uh, from my own point of view, I think many of the uh, traditional issues about authenticity and um, that responsibility for um, um, in, ensuring the survival of that that, that, uh, that collection material over time persist and are unchanged by these collaborations. But the collaborations themselves are looking at them another way. Um, new forms of scholarly communication or, as the questioner asked earlier, new forms of promoting and marketing. And uh, I, I personally don't think that those are, are opportunities to, to shrink from. Um, I do think we, we need to ask the practical questions. Um, Jim Kuhn raised the question uh, when offered such a collection, yes, if, and uh, there may be an if somewhere in your, your conversations with, with uh, the donor of that material, because there will, in fact, be significant cost, and the institution will be in, taking on a significant responsibility for, for new work, which it may or may not uh, have the capacity for without, without funding support. Uh, just a few thoughts on, on that situation. Good luck, I should say. <laughs> other, other questions? Yes, Terry, you're not going to use the microphone. I can hear you. Thanks very much. Does HRC archive the email, the professional email of its curators? Um, very good question. And uh, I have to confess, here in public, 
No, but uh, we will. <laughs> yes, uh, actually, no, but uh, we we don't present we we don't presently do so. Um, uh, I'm afraid we have uh, in our focus on on the collections we've been assembling, we've sometimes neglected uh, our own administrative and internal records, and it's very much a conversation that we are having um, within our strategic planning process. We we recognize the need, and we recognize that that need extends not only only to uh, the paper-based institutional record, but also the kinds of communications that you're referring to. And I will say um, the usefulness of, you're referring specifically to curators' uh, communications, the usefulness of those uh, records for uh, future uh, acquisitions uh, is, is very, very great. And I am an intensive and heavy user of our administrative files uh, and, and certainly need access to that, that material that you're describing. Ask me that again in a year's, year's time. Other, other questions? Uh, yes, over here. My name is Deborah Bennett-Jones. I'm the archivist of the Lloyd Library in Cincinnati, Ohio. Could you tell us more about your workflow procedures for Born Digital Records at Collections and Access? Uh, well, there are other uh, colleagues on staff that would be better able to answer that question in, in detail. But we, we do include um, the in, in the negotiation for an acquisition itself um, explicit uh, uh, details about how we will uh, process material, how we will make it accessible. We're increasingly moving those issues into the initial agreement uh, rather than revisiting them at a later, at a later date. Um, the technologist on staff who I um, I'm, I'm very grateful to, uh, do have in place protocols for uh, capturing either hard drives or storage media of different kinds, uh, preserving its integrity until we get it um, migrated into other, other forms that can become working, working copies that we can actually do something with. Uh, we do try and maintain a, a master that's untouched after that initial replication that occurs. Um, and create derivatives that we then um, work, work with. What we haven't successfully um, done in this life cycle is, um, and I alluded to it in my comments, we haven't worked out the, uh, the policy framework about how we offer up this material in our reading rooms. And I think, um, speaking just for the Ransom Center at the moment, that's a challenge for us. I think it might be a challenge for the profession at large. I know some of you are doing uh, some form of that, but typically in a limited way. Certainly the notion that that born digital content is chained to a reading room desk is not a happy one. Um, but that's the area where we're, where we're focusing a lot of our attention and where I think um, the profession needs to uh, develop best practices going, going forward. Yes. Hi. Uh, hello. Yeah. Uh, thank you, first of all, for um, pointing out that our uh, policy lags far behind the technical infrastructure. I would agree completely with, with that. Uh, I also think that that uh, gets to the very crux of some of the uh, ethical uh, issues at the at the heart of our profession. Uh, so I'm going to push you a little farther. I think on the on the previous point, which is. Uh, the question is, how or should we manage the uniqueness of content that is so easily reproducible? Um, the, um, there are people who will uh, tell you that, um, that the digital content, of course, has a physical manifestation as, as well. And I suppose at some, at some very technical level, that's, that's true. Um, I think our, our own interest, however, more often is not with the artifact at this particular, uh, uh, you know, uh, not the digital object as an artifact, but instead uh, its research potential, which has always, I hope, been the thing that we keep paramount and, and uppermost in our, our minds. Um, our agreements, which I referred to in response to the last question, uh, do ask that 
when digital content is transferred to the ransom center, that it not similarly be placed, because it can be replicated, that it not similarly be placed at Columbia or Harvard or any number of Chicago or any number of other institutions. We don't call you out by name, I should say. Um, but, but the point there is not so much that we are feeling uh, an instinct of possessiveness um, as it is this is a task that, that one of our institutions needs to perform that we don't all need to be performing. So the agreement from its, from its very uh, beginning uh, has built in the fact that this is going to be a, a unique resource. Um, currently, the way Emory is doing it, uh, one does need to visit and see that unique resource in the reading room. And I have no doubt that there's great research value in those Salman Rushdie files that, that people are viewing there. Um, so its ability to be replicated um, does indeed diminish its uniqueness, but I, I think part of the emerging policy framework is, um, from my point of view, around who is going to be the, the custodian, uh, who's going to have the responsibility of collection care for that item, which it's in all of our interests that it exists in one place and, and not be duplicated um, because of the costs that would entail to that. That may not be an answer to the question you were actually asking, but that's... Uh, uh, I, I, think, I think it addresses the, begins to address the point. I think there are also issues of uh, collaboration that we yeah. spoke about earlier that yeah. arise and competition. I like yeah. to think there can be a sort of healthy balance. Um, yeah. uh, I think that uh, there are, uh, th this also applies to purchases as well. Ransom Center is buying literary archives. Columbia yeah. might purchase literary archives. And so um, there, the, uh, a mechanism, which you've just described, for, uh, for certifying, certifying uniqueness um, while being able to make the content as widely available as possible. That's what I'm, that's what I'm thinking about. And thank, thank you, though. I think you did, did address uh, Yeah, OK. That thank, question. thank you. If I could just uh, offer a little further comment, not so much on the Born Digital, but on the question that was posed uh, in the last session about the competition for uh, much sought after uh, uh, research collections of the kind I've been, been referencing. Um, we, whether it's digital, born digital, um, whether it's paper-based, uh, we spend a great deal of time, and I suspect many of you do, in saying no to collections. And uh, in fact, directing those collections or doing what we can to direct those co collections to an archive um, that has already been established. Um, and so the cooperation in this arena, there's, uh, I think it's occurring on many levels and uh, often out of, out of sight and out of view. Uh, but I, I would wholeheartedly agree that, that we need to be um, combining our, our curatorial firepower um, in ways that serve the broadest need uh, rather than um, needless competition, which duplicates work and um, at, at considerable cost. Anyway, another question over, over here. Susan, Susan Brandelson, University of Delaware. In another life, I have served for several decades as the librarian for Yotto, that wonderful estate in upstate New York, which serves writers, artists, composers, sculptors, painters, etc. And when email began to surface at Yotto, the earlier archives of Yotto have now gone to the New York Public Library. I'm aware, yes. Um, when um, email, email began to surface at Yotto and with applications and correspondence coming from Pulitzer Prize winners, etc., I gave them advice, which they are still now following, and I wonder if you would comment on it, which is that um, Yotto print out the emails and file them in their various files for that particular writer, art, author, etc., cetera, um, because the email both to and from Yada was just being lost. That's a, that's a very uh, common and, and widely uh, followed a, approach at many of our institutions. Certainly it was in, in recent years at Emory University uh, when, I was, when I was there. Um, but I think we've, personally, I th and, and this does depend partly on the institutional 
capacity for this work, but personally, I, th I think the, the, the conversation has moved beyond um, making this digital content look like a manuscript. Um, and it, it was digital in its earliest form. Matt Kirschenbaum would insist that is a physical manifestation of a, of a text. And, and, and therefore, um, taking it in that, phys in, in that digital form uh, will likely result in a more complete and useful archive of that writer's communications than asking that writer to print. Uh, or for you to, to, at a later date, print, I think. And I've had a time warning here, so I, unless there's one more question, no, I think we, we end it here, I believe. But thank you all uh, very much for your attention.